Hey everybody, welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. I love being here. I hope you love the podcast. Thank you so much to everyone who's given us a shout out on social media lately, all the great reviews coming in, all the subscriptions that we continue to drive. If you're not already subscribed, head over to Instagram right now and click the link in the profile of the podcast page. And you can subscribe to any one of your podcast providers. We have a link there that allows you to directly subscribe to keep it super easy for you. So you never have to miss another podcast. You know, as soon as they're launched, I'm going to be doing a lot more short individual podcasts going forward because it seems, though, as though a lot of our audience is really enjoying the podcast where I just pick one specific topic with respect to training or fitness or, or optimization and go deep on it. We are going to continue to still have guests but it seems like we've had a ton of requests for people uh, asking me to do specific topics. So if that's something you want to hear about and you want more of, leave us a review and let us know and subscribe and share with at least one person you know and love. Today's podcast is an interview with Mike Israetel, the owner and creator of Renaissance Periodization. And we dive into a lot of awesome stuff with respect to Mike's PhD. How cool is it that he did a PhD? And whether or not being lean and jacked is better for performance. Hell yeah, Mike, good for you. That's awesome. Um, obviously, he's a fan of being big and strong. If you've ever seen Mike on social media, he's uh, definitely a hardworking guy, likes to get after it in the gym. We talk a lot about the things away from the gym in this podcast. So really, um, you know, ultimately how to get people to learn. Learning is a big part of both the cognitive space that we live in and the physical space. And I think skill acquisition, the whole learning piece, is what everyone misses in exercise. And, you know, I've been teaching that on this podcast for a long time. Stop focusing on the tactics and the X's and O's and start working on the habits and skills. Those things are the most powerful things we can talk about. Um we talk a little bit about uh, specific training methodologies such as keto and how, what our opinions are on that. Um, also, something called interoception. If you guys have never heard of interoception, you haven't been paying attention to the podcast. I talk about it all the time. Interoception is the ability to feel the inside of your body, the ability to connect with the inside of your body. So we have proprioception, which is the outside, and interoception, which is the inside. And I think that may be a great opportunity that exists for all of us right now to connect, to learn how to connect with what is on the inside of our body. Uh, we talk a little bit about stress management and a whole lot more. I know you guys are going to love this conversation so much that I've actually convinced Mike to come back and do a part two really soon where we actually dive into training and periodization a lot deeper than we did on this one. Uh, we had a great conversation and got into some stuff that exists outside the gym. If you enjoy this podcast, I know Mike would appreciate a follow as we would appreciate a subscription and a review. Today's podcast is brought to you by Blue Blocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Blue Blocks glasses are something I'm wearing right now to protect my eyes from the strain of looking at a screen. It actually makes a really big difference for me as far as being tired at the end of the day, not having sore eyes at the end of the day. If you guys notice when you watch me on um, any of these videos that I do, sometimes if it's at the end of the day or if it's later in the day, I'll take them off for the podcast interview because the blue really reflects. Uh, but you can see when I have been wearing them for a long time, my eyes get really tired. I start squinting my eyes and I start uh, blinking a lot. And when I wear these glasses, all that goes away and I can feel my eyes are stronger. I'm able to stay awake longer and stay more focused. And that's all thank you to Blue Blocks. And the thing about blue blocks is that these are specialized blue light lenses. These are not just $7 glasses you can get on Amazon. These are actually proven to reduce the harmful high energy blue light emitted from digital devices. So, um, and if you're someone who tends to work at night or likes to watch television or anything at night, the red glasses block a lot of spectrums of light. So you're actually going to get tremendous benefit there in mitigating uh, the blue light or, or just the brightness of light in general. Uh, to help you sleep. And Blue Blocks is hooking you guys up with 15% off if you use the code MUSCLE. Head over to blublox.com slash muscle intelligence. Use the code MUSCLE, 15% off, and free shipping anywhere in the world. Join my podcast with Mike Israetel. Mike Israetel joins me today to talk about everything to do with muscle building and performance. Mike, I, I appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me, man. That's a, that's a pleasure. And you look nice and cozy there in your Stay Puff Marshmallow shirt. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. I like it. <laughs> 
I like it a lot, man. I like it. So, man, you, you've been uh, definitely ascending the ranks in uh, as far as hypertrophy leaders go over the last couple of years, including your business, Renaissance Periodization, which is doing extremely well. And I'm truly grateful to have you on to get into everything to do with muscle building. So, uh, you know, kicking off, we talked a little bit about your um, PhD, and we won't get into that too much, but I'd love to how, talk about how uh, your PhD in sport performance transitioned into this love and passion and ultimately teaching everything to do with hypertrophy. Yeah, totally. Uh, thanks for the question. So um, as I was doing my PhD, you know, before I even did my PhD, it was, I was fascinated with hypertrophy training. I was already training primarily for hypertrophy. Um, but uh, in the PhD, we had an exclusive uh, look at D1 athletes. We had the ability to be their strength coaches and their sports scientists at East Tennessee State, which is where I did my PhD. And that's incredibly rare. In most cases, D1 athletes are off limits to, for any kind of testing because they're too special. You know, you don't want to mess with them. So we had a sport monitoring program at ETSU, which was great, which involved us to both help them as much as we could in their strength and conditioning and their sports science periodization. And it allowed us to uh, collect various measures. So during that data collection, I, I became, you know, uh, pretty interested in, in a bunch of stuff, performance measures, but my personal interest specifically was like, you know, does be, being more lean and jacked really help you in sports? Because as you and I were talking a little bit before we started recording, uh, some people in, in sports, many people, and used to be more, uh, were really convinced that becoming you know, more lean and more jacked was going to make you better at sport. And I understand where they come from, because fundamentally, if you spend too much time trying to become lean and, and become jacked, like, you know, when you were training for the Mr. Olympia, it's not exactly like you had any time left over to train basketball or jujitsu or wrestling. Like, it would have been like, well, my day is completely filled with either training hard or recovering, and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So you absolutely can take it too far and prioritize muscularity and leanness over everything else. But in the context of, okay, you at least get all of your sport training in, does doing something to become slowly more muscular over time and leaner over time, does that help sport performance? Or is it like a red herring that's a sort of just like pointless, you know, you're basically getting caught up in the visual appeal and you're getting away from what actually matters. And my research, in addition to that of many others, which I cited, uh, reveals that, that, you know, as long as it doesn't interfere with your sport training, in almost every sport, with few exceptions, the more muscular you are, as long as you, your power to weight ratio doesn't change too, uh, too suboptimally, the more muscular you are within a wide range and the leaner you are, the better it is. Now, if you could just take a magic pill and become more muscular and more lean, that would, of course, be ideal because it wouldn't interfere with sport training at all, and you could put all of your work into sport training. But, you know, for folks who don't have the magic pill, nobody, right, it's a good idea to allocate at least some of your training time to becoming more muscular, and of course, the strength and everything that that confers. And the leanest thing is easier than everything because it really just means you sort of make sure your diet is logical and don't do anything stupid, and, and most of the calories are burned by sport participation. Because you haven't had the sport culture in some sports where it's like, you know, they train really hard, and then the eating, the coaches say, like, we just eat a lot. You know, we just don't want you to lose weight because that's bad. Yeah. I think we could do a little bit better than that. And I think most athletes, if not all, can be a little bit more meticulous with nutrition specifically and, of course, logically structured weight training such that they maybe are carrying two to three pounds more muscle and two to three pounds less fat. Now, the fact of the matter is that, like, that – can I swear on here or is swearing sure, not a good – okay. Yeah. That fucking matters. Fucking yeah. does. And I don't know about you, but in every sport I've ever played that's not bodybuilding – when the opponent or opponents on the other team are more jacked and leaner, you know you have a fucking problem. Like, hopefully their technique sucks. But if it doesn't, they got you. Their endurance is better. Their strength is better. They're more injury resistant. It's just nothing you want to mess with. So that was kind of the thrust of my PhD. And, of course, yeah. after that, I was even more fascinated with muscularity, leanness, and so on and so forth. And there's so many benefits I could see, right, including, you know, one that comes to mind right away is, is interoception, proprioceptive awareness. Like as as an athlete, if I'm if I'm hyper aware of where my body is in space, that makes me a more productive athlete. No matter what I do, like I'm a really good ping pong player. I've never played ping pong in my life because I'm so aware of my coordination. It sounds weird, but sure. you know, it just makes me kind of apt at whatever you pick up and do because my you know your awareness becomes greater. I think a lot of athletes, you know, the blessed ones, anyways, have great proprioceptive awareness. Sure, and it works the other way too. Really good athletes take to lifting like ducks to water. Yeah. Because like, look, like you train a regular person and for them, a squat might be like an athletic move. Uh, I remember one athlete that I, I, I coach and, and she was and ended up being a very good friend of mine. I taught her how to stiff like a deadlift in one rep. Uh, it was <laughs> the most insane thing I'd ever seen. She like watched me do one rep. And she was like, okay. And then she just did the most flawless stiff like deadlift ever. And I was like, yeah. uh, right on. Well, that's right. what happens when you're the, the best at every sport you've ever seen your entire yeah. life. Like, 
So yeah, and so being a dad, I, I researched that quite extensively. Right, I've read a lot of books on like how to help with with development in all these areas, and it's just exposure. It's like exposure to complex skills from a young age, and I'm sure all these young athletes, most of the time, I mean, there's a genetic component certainly, but uh, exposure to all these different complex skills allows you, your nervous system to adapt, connect, create the the connections in the brain, the neural pathways in the brain, ultimately, and and allow you the diversity of whatever you decide to pick up. I think it's such a beautiful thing. Well, that's actually an interesting point because uh, part of my studying for the PhD and, and other related areas is when I was a professor was the development of sport abilities in children. And I've written a little bit uh, on that topic in, in oh. several works. And it, it is fascinating. And I'll tell you what, like one thing you can't do is certainly is uh, be sure that your child is going to be excellent at this particular sport. Right. It, it's, it's, it's a gamble. Right. But what you can do is expose them to a diversity of athletic movement patterns, very, very basic ones, and make sure mm -hmm. they're fun so that by the time they're, oh, 10-ish for most sports, there's some lower and higher ages depending on when you want to specialize, they'll be sort of really good at everything, mm -hmm. have an exposure to everything, be able to see what parts of that everything they're really good at, like gymnastics and swimming and tumbling around and playing basketball and throwing baseball and maybe even some hockey or whatever, although that costs a shitload of money all the fucking equipment. But um, yeah, I play, my sons play all my kids, both my kids play all those things. <laughs> there you go. So, but like sooner or later, they're probably going to gravitate to one or two of them. And then sooner yeah. or later, just to one of them, and it'll probably be the one they like the best and the one that they're best at. I think some, there's two mistakes to make on that front. One is not involving your children in any kind of movement patterns until way later. And then there's just a, a lot of catching up and they just have to have really, really baller genetics to catch up. Sometimes it happens, but those are exceptions. And the other one is people over specialize in sports too soon and they realize like they could have had a world champion potential tennis player, but they invested all their time and energy into golf. And they were like, you know, like they went to D1 golf, but they never made it to the PGA. And it's kind of like, you know, it's usually better with children to take a real broad strokes approach, but make sure they're in the movement and a huge one, really big one. And this sounds lame as fuck, but uh, make sure they're having fun, especially like when they're really young, like ages like four to 10 it should be like almost all about fun and just getting them moving in different ways. Because if I'd say this, children are programmed as teenagers to rebel from whatever the fuck it is they don't like, especially what dad says. Uh, you know, that shit is like, how old are your children, if you don't mind me asking? Seven and eight. Oh shit, you get another seven or eight years until they're throwing haymakers at you. But but in a sense, it's like if they were look back at sport when they're teenagers and the shit was all fun and they got really good at it, they're not going to quit. But if they look back at sport and they're even if they're good at it and they're just fucking miserable, they're just going to like turn goth or something. And then, uh, you know, <laughs> the ultimate terrible thing that could happen to any person. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, it's a joke. Uh, yeah, man, I, I get it. And I think, um, you know, Exposing the kids has been a really great uh, learning lesson for me. And, and if they don't end up following sports, I still see huge benefit in brain development. Like I want and your health. brain to, yeah, yeah, in aerobic capacity and all those just simple things that, you know, hopefully will give them some advantage as we get older. So transitioning that similar conversation to people who are now fully grown, uh, we know neuroplasticity is a little more challenging after 25 or so, but is there still utility or, or maybe what protocol would, uh, would an elderly or a grown person start to implement as far as trying to improve their ability to acquire skill, right? Acquiring skill or teaching skill is a big part of my business now. And I wonder if you have any unique insights into uh, ways to kind of attenuate or, or accelerate that, um, that process. Well, there's a bunch of different ways to approach that, and lots of them have merit. I would say that I have at least two pretty decent recommendations for folks to keep in mind. Um, one of them is splitting up the learning into many sessions instead of doing a few long sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty clear from the literature that when you're learning new skills especially or trying to refine them, hours long practices at skills at some point just degrade your ability to do the skill and you start learning it wrong due to fatigue. Mm -hmm. So if you have the choice to do like two hours twice a week learning a skill or four hours once, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, one hour four times a week, one hour four times a week is vastly superior from the perspective of skill development. And then the second thing is uh, biting off only as much as you can chew and having patience, kind of like a two-parter there. So a lot of people look at some wildly complex skill, like, like let's say playing tennis. Let's say you pick up tennis when you're 40 years old. And fuck, tennis is like, it looks easy. And you pick up a racket and you're like, what the fuck? Someone, the ball comes at you, you're like, ah, you're just using it for self-defense. Like there's a lot of shit that goes into tennis 
Mm-hmm. But, and if you look at it, you can get really intimidated and you can look at all the people playing well and you can go, okay, I got to learn how to do this now. I got to learn how to do forehand. I, I, I used to play tennis as a kid. Tennis instruction starts with exclusively footwork, like just footwork. And, and it's like, oh, well, this isn't that hard to do. And they teach you how to get in the stance. And then all of a sudden they give you a racket and you're like, oh, I just have to stand here with this racket and run to the ball and then run to the ball in my proper position. And then they teach you how to do a swing. And by learning through stages that are really simple, never overwhelming at any one time, six months later, you're like fucking Neo. You're like, I know tennis, you know? And then it's awesome. I think a lot of people, especially when they're older, because like kids, fuck what kids know, right? They're like, I, they, they don't even know if they suck. They have no idea. They're not even paying attention half the time. And shit happens naturally for them. Adults, you know, let's say you're like a really, really good corporate lawyer. You're a competent motherfucker. Everything you do, you're fucking good at because you gravitate to things you're good at and you had a lifetime of practice. You go into the courtroom, you're the fucking man, you, you know, but when you come on a tennis court at age 40 for the first time, you feel like a fucking total piece of shit and it embarrasses you at a deep level. Like, what the fuck am I doing? This is, why can I, why do I suck at this? This is eight year old better than me. And there's a tendency to sort of freak out a little bit, rush the process. It's all about patients taking their time, learning in small chunks, letting them build the top of each other. And then sooner or later, you're actually really good. Yeah. Imagine the wisdom there, right? Most people get into the gym and, and say, oh, I don't have good genetics or I can't build muscle. And you're like, okay, well, how many months or years did you spend Days. actually acquiring the skill? Right. <laughs> right. Well, everyone, everyone wants that cop out excuse. Like, oh, I can't like, okay, well, you didn't, what you didn't see was the 10 years that existed, you know, of me learning the skill training everything three and four times a week and like oh, sure. I, I have wonderful genetics just like you do right mike like there there was no work and no time put in you know behind the scenes and i think it's important to point out yeah it's easy to see someone really really jacked and get like just baffled at it like there's this almost like chasm between you and them where like i'm human and that person is not human I mean, it's a sweet compliment to receive right. but like people you know like like you know guys will catch me leg training and they'll just shake their head like holy shit and i'm like hey you know like I started with, I used to, my high school nickname was chicken legs. Like from my friend, Ryan used to call me that shit. And he was like way bigger than me at the time. And I was like, God damn it. I hated the fucking nickname, but like my legs are like, they were decently large nowadays, but it's not like they just magically like one day it, just, it fucking clicked. And then my legs blew up. Right. It was like, at some point my legs were decent. And at, at some point my legs were pretty good. And at some point my legs were really big. And it's just, right. uh, the patience and the time and like, yeah, it's tough to see yourself as like the same kind of human as an IFB pro. They're just bigger and, and, and leaner than you. But after you catch some wind in your sails and get a little bigger and get a little bigger, you start to, I don't know about believe, that's kind of lame, but you start to be like, you know, if I just keep doing this process, eventually I'll be 190 pounds. Eventually I'll be 200. And then you look at someone who's 240, you're like, ah, that's crazy. Then five years later, you're like 230 and you're like, ah, all right, maybe I can do this. Yeah, and some people do it faster than others, of course. And there's a lot of levels to that, right? There's the skill acquisition, there's commitment, there's there's nutrition, there's stress, there's sure. autonomic response, like so many things that are, are you know built into that process that ultimately either empowers you to realize like, hey, I can do this, or disempowers you and makes you a victim to you know believing you can't. And I think that's a big part of the message people want to hear or need to hear. How many people do you think have the genetics physically to step on a pro stage? Like what, what fraction of people with genetics that can step on a pro stage do we see on the pro stage versus people that like, forget all the other reasons people don't do it. Like, like they live in Africa and don't have enough food to go day to day, right. but like reasons of just like, just couldn't handle the mental aspect. Like, what, what do you it's think? Bigger, I think it's bigger than people believe. Cause everyone thinks like, Oh, I don't, it's all genetics. I'm like, I don't think so, man. Like if you see my genetics and that sounds funny, but man, my genetics are not spectacular. Like I got certain body parts maybe that are okay, but like I worked my balls off for every ounce of muscle and people don't see that. The level of obsession that went into it, I think it's much higher than you think because there's a lot of shit that if we took someone from the age of 15 years old and taught them everything they need sequentially, what percentage of the entire population? I don't know, maybe, nah, it's probably maybe five to 10, but I think sure. it's bigger. I think it's bigger than what people believe. Yeah. Just yourself, what are you, your thoughts? No, uh, spot on. I think a lot of folks um, have just, just w- wild, wild potential. And for one reason or another, just on psychology, there's many other reasons, but just on psychology, you know, at the end of the day, like especially a sport like bodybuilding is brutal in its own special way. Because like, it, you know, you could say like, okay, like, so I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu, right? And uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu practice is fun. I'm getting choked out by motherfuckers and I'm trying to kill people. It's amazing. It's like what every kid wants to do when they don't grow up is like hurt other people safely. Right. Um, it's awesome. It's like simulated war. Bodybuilding 
like I love fucking bodybuilding training, love it. But I understand I'm a special fucking snowflake. That is some boring ass shit, and it fucking hurts. And the harder you train, the more it hurts. And the weights don't give a fuck about you. You never win against the weights. They just sit there the same way. That brutality of monotony that is bodybuilding is just not for everyone. Like I've actually had people say, like, how do you get motivated to do all that training? I'm like, ah, I can't help you. Like you either want to do it or why the fuck are you doing it? Cause like, honestly, like, yeah, okay. You and I were like jacked or whatever. Like there's so many other awesome, beautiful things about life. Can you imagine sitting on the same plane as Bill Gates and being like, fucking chump, I can bench more. Like, <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. or, or sitting next to someone who's just like a really loving, kind person. And you're like, just a regular person. Like, you're like, well, that guy can't bench anything. And then you talk to him. You're like, oh, this person knows my soul. Like, what a great thing. You could do anything else. That's not the gym and develop excellent qualities. So when people ask you like, how do you get motivated to go to the gym? I really should be like, should you just stay physically active, hit the gym twice a week with some barbell compounds, enjoy the rest of your life. The question of, should I commit myself to hardcore hypertrophy training is one that has to come with an inherent answer to yourself in your soul. You either yeah. want that shit or you don't like if that next set of hack squats is like, nah, then nah, go fuck off. Yeah, man. You're, you're so on point with that. I think people have to motivate me to not go to the gym and I'm sure you're probably in line with that. 100%. And having been a, you know, a pro athlete, I don't try to put, push my kids into any type of athletics aggressively. I think every parent should hear that because uh, just as you'll attest to, there's nobody in the whole world that could have made me go through everything I had to go through to become a professional bodybuilder. And it's the same with every pro athlete, man. There, there's no amount of yelling and profanity and, and anger and nothing that could make me have gone through what I did unless that was an internal drive. There's no way. Yeah, I think that's really great what you're doing with your kids, man. Like. Uh, honestly, I think one of the reasons you probably have the genetics and environment for being a, just a fucking decent person to begin with. But I think another potential reason why you aren't pushing your kids to be psychotic at, at their own expense is because you accomplished things in sport. You take a look at nine out of 10 of the people that push their kids. Like, you, you're going to go to States, boy, I swear to God, God damn it. You're going to win. States. I didn't. Like, yeah. Exactly. I yeah. took second place or I didn't even wrestle or whatever. That's the kind of people that push their kids as motherfuckers never accomplished shit. Like I haven't been accomplished dick in sport, but I've accomplished enough for myself. Like, like I'm a pretty decent grappler, pretty, pretty jacked and lean. Like if my kids don't ever want to do sports at all, I'll be like, Oh, word up, you know, let's play video games together. Fuck if totally. I care. Like it's, it's the people pushing their kids like really, really hard. You got to, you got to wonder like what's going on under, under the hood there. there. There's some famous quote and I have no idea what it's from and I don't want to, I want to pick a name because it'll be wrong, but it's something to the effect of that children are tasked with the unfulfilled dreams of their parents. Yikes. And, uh, yeah. Right. And that's, I think it was like Mark Twain or, or maybe it was Carl Jung, like someone who was like way smarter and, and more famous than me. And I was like, that's so true. Right. Like you, you're, you're cursed. I think it's not even, mm -hmm. uh, it's like they're cursed with the unfulfilled dreams of their parents. It's, and man, you're absolutely right. And you see that everywhere. Like, oh, my son is going to, my son is going to be a professional hockey player. I'm like, okay, you have no idea, dude. <laughs> it's no awful idea. when it comes from people who just don't, obviously just don't have the requisite genetics. Like genet is hard work matters a ton, but you got to have some baseline genetics. Like your son is going to crack in half when someone hits him on the fucking ice. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, he's better off being a computer programmer. I will say though, on the other side of the spectrum, can you imagine what it's like to be a kid who is the son uh, or daughter of someone who accomplished like incredible things in sport. Jordan. Yeah. Fuck, fuck. It's, it's such a mind fuck. Like, imagine being Bill Gates' kids and someone's like, oh, like, how is your career going? You're like, I mean, in the grand scheme, I'm like, hey, shit. But like, you know, like, because, you know, what kid doesn't want to live up to be like their mom and like their dad? Like, almost everyone, right? Like, normal kids, at least that's a phase of like, yeah. I want to be like, I wanted to be like my dad when I grew up. And the thing is, is like, you know, Sometimes the lock of the draw genetically or environment or just special circumstances is that you're never going to measure up to your parents. I'd like to just dump all that shit all together and be like, look, every, we're going to love you, you whatever kid, you whatever in the future when I have children, hypothetically, it's like, just love the fuck out of them, support the fuck out of them, discipline them appropriately so they're not wild animals. And then like whatever they come become, it's like, dude, that's fucking sweet. It's like life's like an open book more than like a your fate. You, you have to become great. Like, look, if you want to become great, we'll be there every step of the way. And if you just want to be a regular, decent person who makes an honest living, that's fucking sweet. You know, the beautiful thing that I got to realize in my career was I got to the top of the mountain or very close to it, and it wasn't fulfilling to me in any way. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And everyone has these aspirations of, of making millions of dollars or making the $100 million business or becoming the professional bodybuilder or winning the Stanley Cup or whatever the fuck it is. And uh, it's not fulfilling. It's, it, that's not what is going to fulfill your soul. It's, it's becoming the person that ultimately is able to accomplish those things, right? It's the process rather than the end result. 
And because I don't have an attachment to the end result, I'm just attached to the daily process with myself and my, my family. It gives a completely different perspective. Like, I want you to be happy and fulfilled and empowered today, not yeah. based on your, your judgment, like other people judging you and giving you a $7 trophy because you want. Like, who fucking cares? For sure. Like, yeah, we want to have a high sense of self-worth today. A little, little bit of a divergence from, from our coach <laughs> training, man. But no worries. Still a useful conversation nonetheless. Um, so speaking of hypertrophy training, we'll kind of, we'll kind of cut right to the chase. Um, you're obviously extremely accomplished in the sport. You've studied it probably more than most people on the planet. Well, I mean, when I say accomplished, you've got a ton of muscle on your body, man. Sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, talking about, you know, maybe the simplest way to start is like, what, what were the things that you did wrong that you're like, man, now here's, here's something that I wish I would have known when I started this. Cause I think a lot of people think they're advanced in muscle building. But ultimately, our, our very low level beginners, ultimately, even the highest level quote unquote fitness celebrities out there, sure. are ultimately what I would class as beginners when it comes to exercise, where I'd put you in the advanced, the, the class of being extremely advanced. Yeah. I mean, I wish I did multiple things from the nutritional end and the training end. On the training end, I'll just pick one, and that's using a full and standard range of motion. I did God knows how many leg workouts where I, you know, like the average bro leg workout where something happens, hypothetically your quads are maybe involved, mostly it's your hips and knees right, and you lifted, a yeah, you yeah. lifted a lot. I remember doing a, an, uh, like a, an eighth squat or quarter squat or something. Uh, I did like 685 for nine and I was like 19 years old, I weighed 180 pounds. And I was like, fuck, like, you know, it was a college gym. So everyone stopped what they were doing. It just the whole gym went silent when I was doing it. Yeah. And they were like, everyone's impressed because everyone's fucking at that age, just a fucking idiot and has no idea what's actually impressive. Right. And then I did that and I was like, man, my quads are going to be fucked up. And like the next day, the only thing that hurt was my knees. And I was like, okay, lesson permanently learned. And then one time I saw this dude uh, squatting and he had bigger quads than me. And he was doing like not very impressive weight, but he was doing like a, a bonus points Olympic squat where it was like, he was sitting into the ground. Like the right. devil was touching his asshole. And I was right. like, huh? And then I tried squatting like that. And I was like, Oh my God, my muscles are feeling it. Not necessarily my joints. And if I had just done that sooner, I would have spared myself a whole lot of like just really ineffective training that, you know, your joints can only handle so much and there's a certain amount they can handle through your entire career. And the more you spare them early, the more that when you're actually strong and, and your joints are at risk, even with a full range of motion, the more sort of oomph you have left in you. And I wish that I hadn't done that. Now, on the nutritional side, uh, you know, more uh, a lot of regrets. But one of them is I tried to get like way too big and I didn't care if it was fat. And I got so fat that I put on way too much body fat. It took me a while to get it off. And like I have like saggy skin in a couple areas. It's fucking stupid and annoying. And I just should have never gotten that fat. I know that sounds dumb, but like people are like, you know, like fucking dirty bulk, bro. Like you just got to fucking eat. Like, you know, the, like over the oversimplifiers, right. especially in YouTube sure. comments, like just fucking eat lift, bro. Like, and it was really that simple. I wonder. <laughs> and that's the most frustrating thing in our world, I think, is, is if you happen to tune into people's YouTube and Instagram comments, the nonsense. And people buy into that shit. Like, oh, that guy's got a 10,000 followers, man. He's got to know what he's talking about. And just fucking banging your forehead being like, you idiots. I mean, ultimately, your body needs just enough to grow or just enough to fuel high level performance. Excess it has no choice but to be stored as fat unless you're genetic and genetic anomaly and, and you're synthesizing protein at a higher rate or, or you know, like it's, it's very unlikely that all that extra calories are going to go anywhere but fat. Yeah, I wish I had known that. I had the fat to prove it. Dude, we all, I did the same thing, man. And that was my coaching from the beginning, right? I was, I was 16, 17 years old and I was like, I want to be Mr. Olympia and made that decision early. And my coach goes, okay, well, here's your, here's your protocol. If, if you can't eat protein every two to three hours, you eat three tablespoons of peanut butter. And I'm like, okay. And, and three tablespoons. It's an interesting of algorithm. <laughs> well, it's just like, you know, there's some protein or he thought, maybe he told me there's some protein in there. There's some fat, you're getting some calories. Yeah, no, no protein, yeah, but something. <laughs> yeah, that was the idea. And again, I put on a ton of weight, got really strong, but it wasn't good weight, right? And and again, it's such a subjective thing to know exactly how many calories to consume until you start tracking, and you're like, yeah. hey, dude, you need to eat three thousand calories a day, and that may be the root of that. Uh, yeah. the, what you're getting to there is just track, man. Track, pay yep. attention. Yep. Uh, awesome, man. So you've you've evolved uh, Renaissance Periodization to be. Uh, an educational platform, a coaching platform. You say you're also um, doing a lot of writing. I'd love to kind of give a uh, perspective on what the business is and what your greatest um, value is or what your greatest contribution is with that business to the fitness community. 
Well, thanks. Yeah. So, um, the business started out as just my business partner and I, uh, the business was his idea. Um, he and I were sharing clients and I was in a PhD program in Tennessee and he was still personal training in New York city where we both sort of, uh, had worked earlier and we were sort of exchanging diet and training clients. Like I had diet clients and they were in New York city and they were like, I feel like my personal trainer is a fucking idiot. And I'm like, maybe (laughs) because they're like, he talked about the diet you wrote in a way that makes no sense to me. And I'm not a nutritionist. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, do you have any trainers in the city that are any good? And I was like, well, yeah, Nick Shaw, like, and they're like, okay. And at some point, and he would, you know, uh, refer his training clients and other folks he knew to me as their diet coach. And at some point it just gets weird to be like my friend, Mike, my friend, Nick. So we started a business for a few reasons, but one of them was just to be like, so we could say my colleague and a business partner. Yeah. That sounds more official. Like it's just more legit. Mm -hmm. So we started RP and then at some point we got enough clients to where we just couldn't take all the clients anymore. And I had, I couldn't take each client load because I had a PhD program uh, stuff to do. And then we started hiring other folks that were at my PhD program because we met, I met a lot of fucking brilliant people that were also getting the PhDs in sport performance. And at some point, we got a ton of questions because we were doing things in like a really pretty scientific way. But, you know, people come to you as clients from a variety of other diets and training methods, and they're used to doing weird shit. Like, so for example, one of the questions we always get, like, so like, what, what's with all these carbs around the workout? Like, are you sure carbs? I'm trying to lose fat. Why am I eating carbs? And we're like, fuck. So there's only so many times you can type out the same response on Gmail until you lose your mind. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. We're going to write an, an ebook that just describes like what the fuck a scientific diet looks like. And, you know, we did a little fancy name. So we called it the Renaissance diet. And once we wrote that book, that was really kind of when we started blowing up because a lot of people read it. Uh, our friend, Chad Wesley Smith on um, uh, Juggernaut Strength tra- Training. He, uh, he or sorry, Juggernaut Training Systems. I always fucked that up. Uh, he gave us an opportunity to write some articles for him. People thought those were nice. And then he published our book for us, our first book. And it was a really, really awesome thing where a lot more people got to know the ideas. And they were like, oh, I guess this kind of fucking makes sense. So we hired more coaches, blah, blah, blah. And eventually we realized that we could, we had sort of uh, systematized the diet and training process so much that we could do it through uh, like templates or an app or something like that. So we built the diet templates and the training templates. And then we built the diet app, which took like forever to build, but we finally got a good team. And now you can have an RP coach computer tell you what to eat and when and how all in on, a, on your fucking phone uh, in your pocket anytime. And that's kind of sweet. And I, I wrote all the basic logic for that stuff and we're working on a bunch of other sort of versions of that app and other apps. So it's sort of like it was never like our plan to take over the world or some shit like that although we are building a giant mechanical octopus to encircle the earth isn't that what all big corporations want in the end that's what we're all trying to do so uh you know our our plan was never like take over although nick my business partner he's much more vision oriented than me i'm like a fucking miniature dachshund i see like two feet in front of my face and uh, just do that so you give me a concept to fuck up and i'll just do that and i'm like what's next but Nick had some vision, but our vision was never like to be like, you know, like, oh, we're going to fucking hashtag take over the industry or some shit. We're just trying to do a good job because honestly, man, we got really fucking tired of people being ripped off by non-scientific bullshit. And some right. of it's not even well-intentioned bullshit. Like people would ask us, like, what do you think of this training method? Like, what do you think of like the keto diet and this and that? Like the keto has a place and it's fine. But to think that it's like some kind of golden magic thing is an insanity. And there's so many people out there, like you mentioned, those Instagram influencers that peddle their version of bullshit and it's just not right for so many people and we don't peddle any version of bullshit we say like hey this is our best interpretation of the evidence and practice give it a shot and maybe it'll work and we don't make bombastic claims like you'll never see any of our ads be like lose all your fat and three fucking days that there's enough of that shit you know like we're never going to be able to compete with it either so we're just trying to do our best i guess so what does a scientific diet look like what is the foundation of it so if i came to you today what would you if if i said mike could you please write me a diet what would be your starting point for like, hey, start here? Well, I'd sell you the proprietary herbs that we have. They're very expensive, but they're worth it because they, you know what I'm saying? They get your your chi. Got it. Because you have to have your chi, correct. Right. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a kind of a hierarchy. So for body composition, if the diet was intended to make you leaner and muscular, we would have sort of an incremental uh, work through various concerns. One is calories. It's the most important thing in the world. Like if you're trying to lose fat, it doesn't really matter what you eat. If your calories are higher than what you burn, it doesn't matter. So the first thing we try to do is set up a decent amount of food for calories. 
After that, we want to make sure your macro split is reasonable, which means feed you enough protein to meet all the functions, roughly a gram uh, per pound per day. Carbohydrates, which are really determined by how physically active you are and the demands of your training, enough to power you, enough to recover from. And then the rest would be fats, and there's a minimal level of fats that you for sure have to have, and there's a bit of play between, play between fats and carbs. After that, we determine, can you still hear me? Yeah, dude, I hear you perfectly. I'm just, I'm, oh, I'm, just, I'm, I'm smiling because it's like, man, isn't it like we're talking the same language, the exact same? Yeah, 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 so sure. It's all basic shit. Sure. And then you, yeah. you look at meal timing next. And, you know, anything between f three to four and seven meals per day is fine. You know, if you train many times a day, right, more meals is better. A lot of that comes down to preference. But if you're eating like once or twice a day, it's probably not ideal. If you're eating nine or 10 times a day, like either you're running a really crazy insulin protocol or like you're just needlessly stuffing yourself with food uh, right. around the clock. And then after that, you're, you focus on more or less kind of the last thing, not to say it's the last in its importance, it's just logically the last, is to fill in all of those. So you, now you have like meals with exact number of calories and macros per meal, and you have them timed out. Now you put in the foods. And the food choices are really, really general rough categories. I mean, most of your protein should come from lean sources, uh, like lean meats or lean vegan products. Most of your carbohydrates should come from veggies, fruits, and whole grains. And most of your fats, if you're adding fats on top to fill your fat source, should come from healthy sources like olive oil, canola oil, and uh, natural nut butters and stuff like that. And then voila, you have a fundamental diet that sort of checks all the boxes. And after that, the biggest thing you're concerned with is auto-regulating that diet to make sure that it uh, continues to produce the results you want. So after several weeks, you're, you know, you might metabolism might slow down a tad. Mostly your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, like how much you move around, starts to fall off a little bit. You might want to make another one or two progressive calorie cuts to make sure you're on track. And, and that weighing yourself and tracking your body weight is a real good way to do that. Although I will say that if you're in the realm of enhanced athletics uh, for bodybuilding, that whole tracking weight shit goes pretty much out the fucking window because god knows what's happening at that point but at the end of the day then you use appearance or something like that so it's all about getting a really good standard diet in place with those sort of markers and then essentially you regulate how much fat you're taking in how much carb you're taking in over time to achieve the desired result yeah isn't that the easiest Crazy. Most simple explanation right now the one question i will throw at you though is how do you uh, manage stress not necessarily personally but with clients <clears throat> obviously uh, someone's someone's HRV, someone's uh, sympathetic arousal, someone's stress is going to influence caloric burn, caloric energy, energy preference. Um, do you have any mm, uh, inclusions or exclusions, I guess, with respect to someone who tends to be more stressed or anxious or has a hard time managing stress? Therefore, maybe it leads to binge eating or maybe it leads to anxiety, you know, sure. whatever. Yeah, that's a really good question. Stress is a super, super important thing. So it's kind of like uh, probably two, at least two general categories where we can take this approach from. The first is proactive stress management. Uh, the most uh, Im important there is just trying to freak out less or organizing your life in such a way that doesn't overwhelm you with responsibilities. Like if you know you're stress prone and you have the option to like take after work salsa dance classes with your girlfriend or not, and you're like in contest prep mode or you're in a serious mode for dieting and you want results, maybe just lay off that shit and go fucking home and relax. Just so you know, like you get scheduling anxiety, like you look at your schedule for the day in the morning, you're like, fuck, like everything's filled in. That's a thing. And maybe you don't overwhelm yourself. That's a good start. Another one is getting adequate sleep. Not a damn thing in the world you can do to out, to out, to beat out sleep. There's no amount of trend you can take that beats out an inadequate amount of sleep, which is hilarious because Charles also fucks up your sleep. That's neither here nor there. <laughs> LOL. But it's one of those things where if you have, if you are sleeping enough and if you're not overwhelming yourself with your various life activities, including work, it sets up a real good baseline for having a, a decent amount of stress. Another stress component that within that realm is not training too much. There's a certain amount of training you can impose on yourself, cardio plus, plus weights included, which is just overload, not just physically, but psychologically. It's just too goddamn much, like three a days every day. Like nobody lasts through that shit. And then diet, if you push your calories really, really low, it actually acts as an independent stressor, like in addition to everything else. So yeah, you could have all sorts of ideas, like I'm gonna lose 2% body fat per week. Like don't do that, because you're just a recipe for burning out. So those are proactive. You set them in place and they make sure that your stress doesn't get out of hand as often or as likely or to that degree that it could. Now that you have those, stress will still come up 
and you have to auto-regulate somehow. Auto-regulating stress means sometimes taking a break, sometimes taking a couple of vacation days, sometimes in, in emergency situations, easing up off the diet a little bit, doing a, a bit more, usually a bit more clean food, just to make sure everything's settled and then you go back into a deficit. And a lot of times um, it can mean training adjustments, including deloads and, and light sessions and so on and so forth, to make sure that you're doing the best job on the front end to make sure that your tra- your stress, you're just not in a scenario set up for stress. It's like you want to be cool. Don't like start out in hell, okay? But also like in order to cool down, if you overheat, you have to maybe take off layers or put on an ice pack. Just the same way with stress, you start off at a normal place, so, something that's not just a recipe for eventual disaster. And then if and when stress comes up, you have to deal with it in a couple of different ways. Yeah, man. I think in the in the immediate gratification culture we have, everyone's like, I don't want to go from off season diet to progressing my way into a logical stress-free or minimal stress progression into getting lean. It's like, I want to go from you know, eating a thousand grams of carbs today to zero carbs, two hours zero. of cardio. Yeah. And that, that's the paradigm that so many people have been perpetuating. And it's, it still blows my mind to see how many prep coaches, as soon as somebody starts the 16 weeks out, it's like, all right, you're going to do an hour and a half of cardio. We're going to like carb cycling with zero grams of carbs three days a week. And you're just like, fuck you idiot like and then people get six weeks out and they're 12 percent body fat i can't lose any fat so now i'm doing three hours of cardio it's so common it blows my mind that people still have a job well if i if i might ask you a question do you, have you seen this in the bodybuilding coaching industry where the incentive for any particular coach is to burn their athlete to, into at least one or two good showings and they sort of don't care about long term versus yeah, because yeah. that happens. Like people will, will be like, "Oh, like I work with so and so coach, and the so and so coach will share that on his Insta." Like we got super fucking shredded and super jacked, and like, right. yeah, what did you take to get like that? Exactly. And, yeah. and then after that, they're like, you know, the next picture of the athlete is like, "Hey, I'm in the hospital. They're running some tests." You know, like the famous post IFV show hospital picture. Yeah. It's almost like a rite of passage. But then, like, you know, the coach is never going to share that shit, and the coach just moves on to the next guy because the next guy found out about this coach. By seeing his Instagram, be like, oh my God, you coach so and so, I want to look like that. And the guy just right. throws infinite amounts of gear and, and cardio at them. That's exactly it. And six months later, they're depressed and suicidal and they don't want to train anymore. They don't want to compete. They're fat and they don't know what to do and their hormones are all fucked up. It happens so much, man. And I refuse to take anybody on for less than 12 months anymore. I'm like, I just won't do it. Oh, wow. Yeah, because I'm like, it, again, I don't take on a lot of people, but anyone I do take on, I'm like, listen, I don't want to do something in three, like any idiot can get you in shape in three months. Like, sure. eat a little less, work a little harder, you'll be fine. But that's sure. not the goal. The goal is to become the type of person who can sustain that level of fitness and health long term. That takes time. We got to develop habits. We got to develop beliefs, identity, all these things that kind of the underlying reality of why you look the way you do and why I look I look the way I do. It's not just the day to day practice. Yes, that's the habit and the skills, but it's the belief, the identity, that you know, the day to day indoctrination of this the, these skills and habits. Right, and that's the shit that people just overlook. Damn, well, they get a lot of value out of your coaching. Me, personally, I coach guys for one fucking week, bro. We're going to gas you up to the moon. Yes. If you die, you'll die you know, with honor in the battlefield of iron. Man, it blows my mind to see some of the protocols that are being perpetuated online if we're talking supplement-wise. Uh, it absolutely blows my mind. Like, And it's every coach going, well, we have to win this show. There's no such thing as your future. If you die after it, eh. But as long as I get my pro card, you know, and anyone's measuring the number of pro card wins, you know, that's an issue, right? Like, I'm going to just push you no matter what it takes, you're going to get that pro card. And as an athlete, most people go, okay, man, whatever it takes, I want to get that pro card because they think something's going to change. They think, you know, I get my pro card and my world's going to change. People are going to have more respect for me. I'm going to start getting sponsorships. My Instagram followers are going to go up. All this nonsense. It's all bullshit. Nothing changes the day you get your pro card, but everybody sells you this glory story. Did you, were you proud of yourself when you got your pro card or what was that day like? So, man, it sounds really maybe maybe arrogant, but I had this belief as soon as I started competing, I kind of had it mapped out and I didn't even give a shit. I almost saw it as a roadblock or as, as like a stepping stone. I was like, yeah, but I'm already preparing for the next show and I'm already preparing for the next show. Like my brain was like, okay, next. Wow. Right? I, w- I went Next day I went right into like, okay, now I'm getting ready for the Tampa Pro and then I'm getting ready for the New York Pro. And I, I just had this like ascension plan. So I didn't take a time a day to even stop and go, wow, I did something great. You know, I got I got a couple of sponsorships, which I which I celebrated, um, but I never took a minute to celebrate, and, and because it just wasn't my goal, man. You get this. Like when I started out, my goal wasn't to be the biggest guy in the gym. My goal was to be Mr. Olympia. So when I became the wow. biggest guy in the gym, it wasn't ever uh, something to celebrate. That's a trip, man. That's pretty unique. 
so the reason being, I mean, my audience knows this, but like in, in 2000, no, 1998, I went to uh, New York City for the Mr. Olympia. First one I ever seen. I was 17 years old. That's a hell of an Olympia to see, man. Oh, uh, dude, it was incredible. I was, I was. It's all downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, totally. I was 17. I was 165 pounds. And I made the commitment that year that I'm going to be a, a professional bodybuilder. I went back the next year in Las Vegas in 99 and I went from 165 to 230. And everyone goes, what the hell did you do? And that was natural, man. That was just me going from a long distance runner vegan to a, you know, eating meat six times a day, training twice a day kind of thing. Um, and uh, that was just like I was, I was 100% obsessively committed. And that, at that point, I was like, there's no other option. Like, you, you know, everyone goes, dude, you're getting huge. And I'm like, yeah, until I look like Flex Wheeler, like, I'm not right. there yet. And that was always right. my standard, right? And that, that, that's why I want to ask that question about athletes holding themselves to that high standard. That was the only thing that pushed me through those hard workouts. Because I would look, and everyone's like, dude, you're looking great. I'd be like, thanks. But until I look like that, you sure? I'm not there yet. Well, you got bigger than Flex Wheeler. I hate to be the first person to break it to you. Well, you know what I mean, but the the, the aesthetic. <laughs> thank you, man. The, well, the no one's ever going to get that shit. Yeah. Well, but that was the goal, right? I wanted sure. to be. Yeah, I wanted to be that great, and I, yeah. I still view him as one of the greatest ever, and as well as a lot of those guys from that that era. Flex Wheeler has a timelessness to his physique. You see, like if you show someone a picture of Ronnie Coleman and they're not into bodybuilding, there's a chance to be like, "Wow, cool," and there's an, an equal chance to be like, "What the fuck?" Right. If you show someone a picture of Flex in his prime, most people are like, "That's art." Like, did Da yeah. Vinci draw that? You're like, yeah. "See." Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was incredible, man. He's become a very good friend of mine, and to see the struggles that we all go through is so interesting, man. I think you know I've got a very uh, profound interest now in understanding you know human psychology and what drives us all, and it's amazing to see the highest level athletes from you know a Ray Lewis to a Michael Phelps to a Flex Lewis, and on all the the struggles and the traumas we all go through, and we everybody from the outside thinks get your shit together. By the inside, it's a fucking disaster. <laughs> it's just, sure, you know, it's so. always it's always a struggle, and sometimes that's what drives you, right? And ultimately, we all have something inside that fuels that, I don't know, say anger or fuels whatever it is that that drives us to be better than everybody else. One hundred percent, gonna sound yeah. better. Good. I know you got you're on a timeline, man. So I'm super grateful for your time. I, there's a lot of stuff I wanted to dig into. Like I wanted to get into um, your your maximum recoverable volume principles, your your uh, your reps and reserve principles. Do you have a few minutes to talk about that? Oh uh, yeah, or you could have me on some other time. We Let's could like it. really dig into that shit. Let's do it. I'd love to, man. We got into All some right. some uh, obscure tangents today but let's let's uh, commit to having you back as soon as possible mike it's an absolute pleasure man where can everybody find for more from you thanks for having me dude it was a pleasure um rp strength on instagram at rp strength at rp d r m i k e that's my instagram and then renaissance periodization youtube actually is uh, we're putting tons and tons of content on there all the time really informative shit uh, my dry is stupid humor as well um so renaissance periodization on youtube find us there and then all the other shit is linked so very That's cool, it. man. We definitely will link to all that stuff in the show notes. And thanks once again for being here, man. Thank you so much. Ladies, gents, that's a wrap. Hopefully you enjoyed this chat with Mike Israel as much as I did. Mike is a wealth of information. And I just love the fact that the guy is not only talking the talk, he's walking the walk. There's so many people out there who like to dive into the theory but don't want to apply it. And, and ultimately, theory is absolutely useless without an application because you don't understand where the rubber meets the road. I hope each and every one of you can take something of wisdom from this podcast and apply it right now to your life to ultimately live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. We frame this podcast around the six pillars of a lean, healthy, and muscular body. The six things we can do to create our greatest body and our greatest life. Hopefully you pulled at least one of those out of this podcast. If you did enjoy this podcast, I know that Mike would appreciate a follow and we would definitely appreciate a subscription on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you did enjoy the podcast, and you want more like it, leave us a review, guys, because it's always amazing to hear from you. I go through the social media on a daily basis to answer as many questions as I can. And if you're not already part of the Muscle Intelligence Facebook community, you're missing out. What are you doing? Get in there. All right, guys, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you truly. I know you have a lot of different podcasts you can choose from and you choose ours. So thank you so much. Have an amazing day. Live your greatest life in a body that you love. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. 
This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.